As we travel through the Old Testament book of Proverbs, we're talking a lot about being wise. And we've met all kinds of people, wise and foolish. People who seek the truth and those who don't. I'm Steve Schwetz, welcoming you to Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, today, we're going to hear more about those people, and they just may remind you of, well, maybe your coworkers, your friends, your neighbors, and perhaps family members. You might even recognize yourself. Well, one thing to be sure and notice is we all have a hole in our heart that only God can fill. You know, letters like this one from Alexis in Wisconsin remind us to pray for those who faithfully seek Him. I first heard through the Bible on a local radio station, Alexis writes, I enjoyed it and didn't hear it again for another few weeks. This continued for several months in between my errands. Now I listen online. Initially, I did not realize how old the broadcasts were. When my husband and I found out that Dr. McGee is now in heaven and the messages were recorded long ago, we were blown away at how much truly hasn't changed in the human condition. We are a young adult couple with a young son. We have a toxic, pagan, New Age background and have to literally be born again, stripping away the old and putting on the new. These teachings are so helpful in learning grace and are something I look forward to every day. I've been sharing you with my friends, family, and strangers, including last week with a Chinese man who now joins us in Mandarin on the app. Way to go. Thank you for this ministry. I pray many people will decide to put their faith in Christ around the globe, all to the glory of God. Yes, all to the glory of God. Thanks, Alexis. Thanks for your letter, and thanks for sharing the program. And what are you learning as we journey through the Bible and specifically through Proverbs? How's God using His Word in your life? Well, you can tell us it's easy. You can email us at BibleBus at ttb.org or write to us at Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. You can also leave a message at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Speak to us from your word about how to be faithful and wise. We pray for those whose hearts are longing to know you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we're off to Proverbs 25 on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, as we come today to the 26th chapter of the book of Proverbs, I am reminded that I did not quite finish chapter 25. That is, I did it in a hurry, as we do many times, and I always go back and I say, my, I wish that I had dwelt with that in a little more detail because it is important. Now, these Proverbs, they fit right in to life. They anchor right in, and it's well to have them before us. Now, I go back in chapter 25 and just pick up the 23rd verse there. It says, the north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. Now, we are living in a day of sweetness and light, and you're not supposed to rebuke anybody today. Every now and then, I get a letter from some lovely saint who rebukes me for being hard on certain groups not individuals, I'd never single them out, but on certain movements today. Well, may I say to you that I believe that that's what I should do. The north wind driveth away rain, and maybe we need rain, and we always need it in Southern California, and we don't have enough. And when that north wind comes and you know you're not going to get rain, well, that's disappointing. But I'll tell you this, An angry countenance will take care of a backbiting tongue. It'll take care of those that are teaching things today that are wrong, and I think that they should be dealt with. And I intend to continue to speak out when we feel like that it's important to speak out. I feel that this is a very important proverb. It's wonderful to have sweetness and light all the time. But we're living in a world in which there are serpents along the pathway of life. There are pitfalls. There is false doctrine today and false teaching of the Word of God. And I want to do it, speak out, but I hope I do it in a spirit of love and in a sense not to hurt individuals, but to try to give the truth of God today. So, I find ample justification in the Word of God, and here's a verse for it. Now, verse 24, and we've had this up several times. It's better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman 
and in a wide house. You would think that Solomon, who had so many, must have had a lot of trouble with some of them with the fact that he wrote these Proverbs. This, of course, was set in order by the man of Hezekiah. And I sometimes wonder if when he went for a ride in the chariot, if maybe he didn't have a backseat driver there. That could have something to do with it, by the way. And again, may I say, verse 26, a righteous man falleth down before the wicked is as a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. You know, when you're hungry, I should say thirsty, and you can be hungry too, but when you're thirsty, I've had that when I was a boy, go hunting. We never knew what it was to take water with us in any kind of a water container. And we would come to a creek or a fountain, and sometimes it would be limpid water, and in that day, there was no pollution around. But every now and then, you would find a spring that had been polluted, the scum on it, green. What a disappointment it is. And he compares that now, that when a righteous man, a man that has stood for things, finally he bows before the wicked. How many times that happens in business? How many times that happens in politics? That a man that has stood for something, in order to get into office, he bows before the wicked. And sometimes it happens in the church even today. A man that has stood for doctrine, he stood for things that are right, but he begins to compromise and cut corners. That is the heartbreak today. It's just like coming on a fountain when you're thirsty and finding it covered with scum and polluted. What a verse this is. And then it's not good to eat much honey. So for men to search their own glory is not glory. When you eat too much honey, it's not good for you. A little honey is good for you. But a lot of honey makes you sick. And for a man to be so ambitious, especially in the things of God, be a pusher, well, it makes you sick. In fact, it makes you sick at your tummy to see that type of thing. And by the way, we see that type of thing around us today, this inordinate ambition among Christians. Now, we'll be back at that when we get to the book of Ecclesiastes later on. Now the last verse, he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that's broken down and without walls. A man that cannot, or a woman that cannot control their emotions, not self-control. And you know that's one of the fruits of the spirit. Now there is a time for a person to let go, as we've seen. There's time to stand for something and speak out with great emotion. But my friend, there are times when we need to recognize to control our own spirits. Now, we come to the 26th chapter, and we begin here again with a whole section here that deals with the fool. The Bible has a great deal to say about the fool. Now, what he's talking about is not the man that is mentally deficient. He's not talking about the simple-minded or the one today that has some mental aberration and maybe it needs to be put in an institution. The fool that's mentioned here is a man that may be brilliant. He could have a Ph.D. degree. David put it like this, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. And it is a man that, though he may be brilliant, yet he is very much of an oddball, and he is an atheist. Now, the Scripture says, and that Hebrew word means insane. He's an insane man. The inner marriage sometimes produces very brilliant offspring, but also there be a mental deficiency. One of the pastors of the church I served in Nashville went way back to the beginning of the church, way back in the early days of Tennessee. And he had married into the governor's family there that had intermarried, and as a result, there was insanity in the family. And this man had two daughters, and they were brilliant. 
But when I became pastor, they were old ladies. They lived way out in the country, way up in the hills of Middle Tennessee on a farm. And I was holding meetings in that area, and they wanted me to go by to see them. Well, I went by to see them, and I have never met any two women that were more brilliant than those two women. They knew all about me, all about the church I was serving. They knew the Bible. They knew literature. They were acquainted with music. They were up on current events. I'll be honest with you, it was amazing. But you know, there was something very odd there. The pastor that took me says, now don't be surprised at what you see. Well, when we went in, we had to shoo the chickens off of the chairs to sit down, and then you had to be rather careful. And while I was sitting there talking with them, from the kitchen, a cow stuck her head in the door. And there was a horse over in the bedroom. And there were goats around. And you could sure tell them. I never saw them, but you could tell they were there. And that was the thing about them, a mental aberration, you see. Now, there are some today, may be brilliant, but they're atheists. Now, God says that's insanity. Now he's going to talk about the fool here for several verses. Let's look at it. As snow in summer and as rain in harvest, so honor is not seemly for a fool. One of the marks of a fool is that he doesn't mind sacrificing his honor, has none whatsoever. Verse 2, as the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. In other words, the prediction made that certain things will come to pass doesn't always happen. And by the way, that's something for a lot of these so-called prophets today that are in our midst. They're telling us what's going to happen in the next few years. They may be right. I don't know. They don't get it from the Word of God. Now, will you notice verse 3? A whip for the horse, a bridle for the ass, and a rod for the fool's back. That's a good one, isn't it? Whip for the horse, a bridle for the ass. Got to put a bridle on a little donkey. Well, a fool, the only thing he'll respond to is real discipline. Verse 4. Now we have two verses here that I used to hear as a boy by our town atheist. He always enjoyed pointing out contradictions in the Bible. Here's one of them. Now, will you notice it? Verse 4 says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Now, isn't that a contradiction? No, my friend, that's no contradiction at all. That sets before you and me two lines of conduct when a fool speaks. May I say to you that I get letters from different individuals, and I get letters from folk I'd put in this classification. Some of my answer, some I don't answer. Now, it's not because I can't answer them, but answer not a fool according to his folly. You have to decide. That's what the writer of the Proverbs, now, if you decide to answer him, you lay yourself open you may be like him. You may end up being in the same classification. Now, I had that experience recently. I answered a man, a brilliant man, and I thought that he would respond to the answers I gave. Well, I never got such a foolish letter as I did from him. I'm through now because why? Answer a fool according to his folly was my first reaction lest he be wise in his own conceit. This man had some wrong ideas. And I don't mean that his doctrine was different from mine, but he had some impressions about me that were entirely wrong. I tried to correct them. Well, I made a mistake. Why? Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. And I felt very foolish when I got his letter. So there are two lines of conduct, and you have to determine whether you should or shouldn't. Are you willing to put it on the line and be classed like that? Now, let's keep reading. Verse 6, He that sendeth a message by the hand of a fool cutteth off the feet and drinketh damage. You make a mistake if you send the message by the wrong individual. Verse 7, The legs of the lame are not equal, 
so is a parable in the mouth of fools. Now, I want to tell you, there are certain interpretations of parables that are given today that I feel like I'd like to put that over their interpretation. So is a parable in the mouth of fools. But I better not do that. Verse 8, as he that bindeth a stone in a sling, so is he that giveth honor to a fool. You're just giving him, you know, ammunition. That's all in the world that you're doing. And then verse 9, as a thorn goeth up into the hand of a drunkard, so is a parable in the mouth of fools. You give a parable to some individuals, and it's just like picking up something, finding that you picked up a rose, but there's a thorn in it. This is a tremendous chapter, is it not? Now it says, The great God that formed all things both rewardeth the fool and rewardeth transgressors. And you can be sure of one thing, the ultimate outcome, God will handle this matter and take care of it. Now we find here something rather frightful. As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. And I know of nothing that is as harsh as that. You know, it's repulsive and sickening to even think of this. But you remember that this is the viewpoint that Peter presents to us concerning the hypocrite. The hypocrite, he says that the dogs return to his vomit, and the pig, old sows, return to a wallowing again. You see, there was a little pig that left the pig pen and went with the prodigal son. But since he was a pig, he went back to the pig pen. Only sons will go home. And eventually, hypocrites are revealed in the church today. And there are many. There's no question about that. man said to me the other day, he wanted to give us the reason for not joining the church. He says, McGee, the church is filled with hypocrites. Well, I says, no one knows that any better than I do. That's no reason why you shouldn't be in it. You can't hide back of a hypocrite. You should be in there revealing what is genuine. That is the thing that is important. And the important thing to note is, and I've had several letters on this recently from folk that didn't like the fact that we mentioned this, that there is the security of the believer. But I also said there is the insecurity of the make-believer. And that is the thing he's talking about here. Now I'm going to drop down here quite a ways. Well, let me pick up verse 12. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit, there is more hope of a fool than of him. Now there is something worse than that, an egomaniac, one that has a high opinion of himself. Then as you move on down, and I'm going to drop down now to verse 20, where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no tail-bearer, the strife ceaseth. The thing that today keeps all the bitterness stirred up in certain groups is the fact that there are just a few in there. They are the ones that keep putting a little something on the fire, you see. If there's no one that like that, then the fire will go out. The strife will cease. And then verse 21, as coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kennel strife. Certain folk, that the minute that they enter a church or join a church or are in a church at all, they cause strife. You find that in the Lord's work today. They just seem to stir up things all the time. And they're never interested, really, in the Word of God, though they make pretensions. He's mentioned this before here. Now, verse 22, the words of a tale-bearer are as wounds. Actually, the better translation is the words of a tale-bearer are dainty morsels, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Now, you may like to hear that little choice bit of gossip. You know, we like to hear that. <laughs> but it's hard to digest. It'll finally make you sick. You're a child of God. You don't want to hear that ugly thing. And yet a great many people, they like to hear these things. Dr. McGee had a bit more to say on this subject, so stay with us. 
Next time, we continue our five-year journey through the Bible. Until then, reach us at ttb.org or call 1-800-65-BIBLE. Again, that's ttb.org or 1-800-65-BIBLE, or you can always email us at biblebus at ttb.org. Now here again is Dr. McGee to close our study today. You probably noted that we omitted verses 13 right down to verse 19. And it's a section about the sluggard. And we've had that fellow up before us several times here in the book of Proverbs. And here is, I think, about the best picture that we have of him anywhere, certainly a definition of him and a real picture of him. And I want to look at him for just a few moments here as he's pictured to us in verse 13. I don't think that you could put the sluggard as being synonymous with the fool or with the wicked. He belongs in a class to himself. A sluggard is a person who is habitually lazy. You know people like that? Well, I know people like that. They don't work. They're in the church. They're Christians, many of them Christian, but they're lazy. It's difficult today to get Christians to work. I talk to quite a few men who employ several people. One man employs several hundred. He tries to get Christians. And yet he says, I find that sometimes they are the laziest lot of all. Well, a sluggard, you see, can be a Christian. And here is a picture of him. He says, there is a lion in the way. Can you believe that? I wonder if he doesn't really imagine it. You ask him, why isn't he out there on the street? Why isn't he getting down where the rubber meets the road and start doing something in this life? at least working for God. And he says, well, there's a lion out there, and you don't expect me to go out where there's a lion. Well, personally, I haven't seen a lion on the street in a long, long time. The last one I saw on the street was in a cage in a circus parade. So this is not a very good excuse, but he imagines that there's a lion out there. And even if it was, you remember one of David's mighty men, it says of him, he killed a lion on a snowy day. In that snowy days when everybody stays in, but not this man, and he became one of David's mighty men. You never become one of God's mighty men if you're afraid of the lion that's out yonder on the street. A lion is in the streets, he says, and he's just not going to go out there. And here's another picture of him. As the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the sluggard upon his bed. Now, he oversleeps, of course sleeps more than he should, and he, you know, just tosses back and forth, but he's not about to get up. He's going to stay in bed. What a picture of him. And look at him here. In verse 15, it says, the sluggard hideth his hand in the dish. It is wearisome to him to bring it to his mouth. You know, even eating for him is quite a chore. He puts his hand in the dish, and he's so lazy that he finds it difficult to bring it to his mouth. Friends, I would say that that's the very height, uh, the very lowest of being a sluggard, uh, being a lazy individual. And it says the sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men that can render a reason. And the interesting thing is about these fellows like this, they always have the answer. They always can tell you how to do it. I know that I had a man on my staff at one time, and I think he was about the laziest person I've ever met. And I've met quite a few lazy people. And this man was an ordained preacher, by the way. He always wanted to come in and tell me how he thought I ought to do it. And I used to tell him, well, you get out and do your thing yourself. We don't have you here to tell me what to do. I know what I'm to do, but I want you to do what you're supposed to do. But he never was that good at it at all. And then you read in verse 17, He that passeth by and meddleth with strife belonging not to him is like one that taketh a dog by the ears. And you better let that dog alone that's in the neighbor's yard. You better not catch him by the ears because you're going to get bit. And you better not meddle where there's strife. 
the best thing to do is to not enter it at all. Somebody's going to say, well, this is just good advice. Friends, that's exactly what it is. Good advice. Now, until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved, and may you listen to good advice. Jesus came home, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. We're grateful for our committed listening family who faithfully pray and invest in Through the Bible as we together take the whole word to the whole world.